Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and I am here to present you with a digital rebar install process. This is the manual version on packet.net. Um, it's going to use our new portal. Uh, I'm using the latest version, which is actually not the stable. It's the one with all the cool, buzz, neat features. Um, the, the stable portal.racken.io will, will, should look like this in a day or two. Um, but I loved having the quick start here. So if you bring up the portal, it's going to take you straight into uh, being able to log in with a Racken account. If you don't have one, you can just create it. So I get to log in here. Um, and I can also put in my endpoint address and some things like that. But the nice thing here is the quick start is just embedded in the page with some bookmarks so you can track through as you go through those instructions. Of course, you can just open it in a new page here also if you'd like to have a full tab to read on, uh, read on like I, I'll often do over here, just sort of drag it out of the way. Put it on another screen so it won't distract us. Uh, and for this demo, what we want to do is go ahead and, and get a packet.net server. So uh, if you use RACKN100, all caps, uh, the number 100, it will get you a credit. So you there's more than enough in that credit to, to replicate this demo multiple times. So. Uh, I've created a CentOS uh, server using this process. So here's my new server. Uh, I've been using um, New Jersey. Type 0 is their smallest. It's more than enough to run digital rebar. Um, Sense 7 is what I'd recommend. If I deploy that server, uh, that will basically give me a server just like this one. It's already deployed, so we don't have to wait. And if I go from that server over here and SSH into it, there's my server address. I'm logged into the system, yay. And then from here, I need to grab my quick start information. So if you go down here, there's a whole bunch of prep information. You should read it. I've already read it. Um, and then I just need to execute this command right here. It's going to get the digital rebar uh, stable release. Uh, this For this demo, it's a 3.7 release. We just dropped that. And then it's going to run the, the install in isolated mode. So there we go, there's the code line. And it'll download it, pull it in, do all the, the work necessary to check your dependencies. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to make this super easy. This will get Digital Rebar um, basically in place, it's Golang. Uh, it won't actually start it, so there's a couple options to start it. You can run it as a service. Uh, by default, this quick start is going to put it into the um, running in memory version, uh, so it's not going to be persistent across reboots or things like that. It's a nice way to get started if you're doing any, any type of infrastructure. If you're keeping Digital Rebar around, uh, read some of the options and run it as a, as a standing service. So here, um, I need to start Digital Rebar. In this case, it's populating some information we want, some directories, default content. Uh, it's going to run it in the background, and I'm going to use the IP address. Uh, if you're on a Mac, Obviously, packet's not going to be a Mac, but you, you, there's some additional instructions. You should read through those. And I'm going to go ahead and start it. At this point, Digital Rebar's running. Uh, it's running in packet. Uh, it's, it, we do not connect the SAS to Digital Rebar. Your browser over here is the connection point. So what, what I can do is um, if I connect this endpoint, my, my browser is going to connect. It does the portal, the SAS portal is not, in the, is not connected directly to the endpoint. It's all relayed through your browser. Um, and what you'll see is I'm going to go ahead and put my address in here. I'm going to log in and it's going to give me a big warning. Uh, this warning might show up in a login prompt. It often shows up here telling me I have a security accept, exception. Since I just installed it in the quick start, I did a self-signed certificate. I have to accept that certificate. And you'll see by default it's going to push me back to the portal. Uh, I'm going to stay where I was um, in my, my latest version. Here's my endpoint address. This is the packet machine on port 8092 where our API is based. If I was to open that up uh, directly, I could go to the Swagger UI and actually download the Swagger endpoint information. Uh, that I need to do. And there's something telling me schema is not, I'm, I'm not identifying the schema correctly, so there's a mistypo in there. 
Um, so here uh, I'm back in the UX. I'm going to go ahead and, and log into the portal just using the defaults. And what you'll see here is that the system is giving me a, a wizard. So this basically tells me the version that I'm running, some flags, information about the system, and it's going to take me through this wizard. When all these things are checked, I've got a fully functioning system infrastructure. This is designed to help me get things configured. In Packet, I actually don't have any subnets because it's not a DHCP infrastructure. Uh, so my next step is ISOs. Uh, ISOs are the actual boot environments. So that's the, the operating system I need to boot. Uh, in this case, I'm going to upload a CentOS install. I'll show you what that looks like actually before I do it. So if I go into my boot environments list over here, what you'll see is here's a whole bunch of operating systems that are available to me. You'll see the X's, that means they're not available. Um, so if I click one of these links, I can download the ISO, and then I have to upload it into uh, the digital rebar endpoint, right? Remember, it's, there's no direct connection, so we don't automatically pull things in. We do have a cheat that uses the CLI to upload an ISO and push it into the system. So I'm going to just do that one, and this will download uh, CentOS and then push it into Digital Rebar. Uh, that's pretty handy. It, it takes a little bit of time. I can go a little bit faster um, if I want. I can go in and you can see it's it's in the process of uploading that, that image. I can upload from my desktop. This is actually going to drag it across the internet, send it to the endpoint and pack it. If I'm inside my network, this is a great way um, to go ahead and get um, get files downloaded. Uh, if I download them once, then I can just keep uploading them. It's much faster. And I want a new sledgehammer image going here. So we are going to go ahead and take this sledgehammer. Sledgehammer is our discovery operating system. It identifies that it already knows what this is. So it's going to pull it from my list and I'm going to go ahead and upload it. So this process is sending that boot environment. Sledgehammer is highly optimized discovery CentOS based image. Uh, and it's sending it to Digital Rebar for provisioning. Uh, and at the same time, in the background, I'm still uploading, downloading the CentOS image into the um, onto this local system, it pack it, and then I'm going to have to upload that into the um, Digital Rebar endpoint running in packet. So that's actually got to do the up, the download and then upload into the local system. It's still pretty fast. Um, and you can see with logging, you can actually see all the API actions that are, we're doing in this case. Um, I can still type. I still have control uh, DRP CLI. Uh, let's see, ISOs list. Um, so I can still use the CLI and take actions and do things like that. It's a little busy right now getting getting these machines. So I'm already I've already uploaded Sledgehammer. And the way the system's going to work is all of the boot environments that require Sledgehammer, have this, you can see them very clearly, they are now identified with checks telling me that they are available for use. If there's an X here, you can't use it yet. Um, but as soon as you upload, it will, it will uh, compare it against boot M's and apply it to any boot M that's, a boot M that's available. That is also true for... Um, uh, basically, if you drop it in place and then restart Digital Rebar, you can you can get content into the system in a lot of different ways. Let me check in on our wizard. Our wizard says, hey, now we have ISOs. That's awesome. And it's telling me I have to set preferences. Preferences over here are the things that say, hey, I don't want you to, I want you to actually take action. By default, Digital Rebar is safe. Uh, so it ignores rec uh, requests and boots to local. So I want to set these things to go through it into my discovery image. You could go directly into an operating system if you wanted. Uh, here we're just going into discovery. So it's going to say, hey, if you don't know what to do, go into the discovery stage. I have to save. Uh, it said, now knows I've done that work. Uh, stages over here are where the system goes in to uh, take different actions. And so we use stages to build a workflow. Uh, in this case, I just want a really simple workflow, so I'm going to go ahead and use the workflow wizard. Uh, and so what it's done, 
uh, is it's go, it went ahead and built up a sequence of steps. So to go from the, the Discover to Sledgehammer, CentOS, uh, and Ubuntu. So all of those steps are, are in place here. What I would like to do is uh, actually do some work. I'm in Packet, so uh, this additional step is very helpful for Packet. Um, and what that means is I want to take Packet's out-of-band management infrastructure, and this has some other helpers for Packet, like it uses Packet's keys and things like that. I need to transfer that plugin into my digital rebar endpoint. So it pulls it out of our SAS, through the browser, and then uploads it into digital rebar. At no point is are we telling digital rebar to contact the SAS. It's always going through uh, the UX, the management, or the CLI. So at this point, I've added Packet into the system. That'll add some stages, uh, Packet SSH keys, Packet Discover, into the system that I need to accommodate. And then the other thing I want to do is while I'm here, I'm going to bring in a little bit of extra content. Um, so the task library is super handy to have around, so I'm going to transfer that also. Um, and you'll notice when I do that, it, can, it comes in, it's aware of the versions. Um, I can upgrade if the, if the content's not updated. So if I had been on a 1.5 version, I could move that to 1.6. Um, so basically anytime I wanted, so if I took our Terraform, uh, sorry, this is our Kubernetes installment. If I had uh, downloaded it before, and so the 1.4 version was there, I could actually go in and say, you know what, I'd actually like to upgrade it to the new version. I can compare versions to see what the differences are between those two versions, not much in this case. And then I could go ahead and uh, upgrade that content, so it'll switch it to 1.6. So all that, there's a whole bunch of, of information in these content bundles. They have parameters, tasks, stages, templates, all, all combined together. It's a little outside the scope uh, for this demo. I'm getting a little farther afield. So what I want to do is I'm going to change my discovery step. And instead of using uh, that, actually here, I'm just going to let the wizard redo it. Uh, should be smart enough to recognize packet. Yep. So now that I've had the packet installed, it knows, oh, I have packet uh, available, so it's going to include the packet process uh, into the system. The way these things work is they're global. This is the global profile. I could actually do workflows for blocks of machines based on profiles. There's a whole bunch of um, uh, complex and interesting applications for these workflows. Let's check in on where we, where we are. So at this point, I'm very close to being done. I've gotten my system preferences. I've built a workflow. I've uploaded ISOs. I am now ready to boot machines. And that means going back to Packet. Um, I have this one machine, Server 0, I've already built. I'm going to go ahead and reboot that so that it goes through this process. And I'm going to turn on event logging so I can watch, what, watch what's going on uh, as, systems, as things come into the system. But I'm going to show you how to add your own server. So in this case, I'm going to create server 1. I'm going to, it needs to be in the same data center, or it should be. It's, you're going to pay a lot of bandwidth interconnect if you don't. And I'm going to choose custom iPixie. So here, I need the address of my server. It's in a couple of different places. There we go. And I'm going to go to HTTPS, or HTTP, not S, the address. 8091, you can see I've done this once already. And then uh, 8091 is, our, is the Pixie boot location. So it's the HTTP side. And then I have to say default iPixie. Um, that address, if I just try it from here, it is going to be the iPixie instructions that the, that the system needs, the firmware needs to boot the infrastructure. So it directs it to install Sledgehammer. That's what's set when you set the defaults to uh, default boot environment to discovery. It tells it to do this change uh, when it doesn't know about a machine. Once it knows about a machine, it will uh, continue to take advanced actions and you can control the workflows. So the options here, I need to persist Pixie on reboot. Super handy to do that, so I, I don't just do this once. I'm going to do another server, so I'll have two more servers, and I'll say deploy. And so now Packet is going to provision two more servers. So four servers all told in this demo. Over here, 
what you'll see is it's actually getting event logs coming in through the system. Um, and you can see updates to the machines that I have uh, provisioned. Uh, it's actually aware that they're booting, they're coming in, they're doing a whole bunch of um, discovery actions. We even set the TTY console so you can use the emergency logging uh, cert feature for packet. Uh, here, out of band info. So I can come into here. Super fun to do this. Uh, bring up a new terminal. And so if I do this action, uh, what it'll actually do is I can watch the machines boot uh, using their, their console uh, component. Uh, now this will only work the second time. We have to be aware that it's a packet uh, process. So what's literally happening behind the scenes here is these machines are being going through packet discovery, installing a sledgehammer, and then they're running the stage uh, packet discovery. This packet discover, uh, I'm going to minimize this so uh, the events don't go, um, goes in and actually checks their internal API and, and registers the uh, unique identifier for that machine and also downloads the SSH keys that you've stored in packet and sets the console. So all of these tasks are actually done to, um, once a machine's identified as a packet machine, we take specific actions that are necessary to uh, correctly support a packet machine, right? So very, very easy ways to take advantage of different infrastructure. We have similar capabilities for VirtualBox. Uh, so if you're doing a VirtualBox demo, then you would want to use the VirtualBox plugin uh, and get similar functionality. One thing I need to do uh, and is set up, uh, I haven't fully set up my packet infrastructure. I need to go up into plugins. I want to add a plugin. I've, here's packet. So this is only added the provider for the plugin. It doesn't actually implement the plugin. If I use that provider, it's going to create a packet plugin. I need to use the um, API key for packet. This actually authorizes it. So when I add this, that will allow me to take the machine. So here's my server. And what you'll notice here is that it's actually come through and collected packet information. So this is my packet SOS screen that I just did. This is my packet UUID. Uh, this is super nice. Uh, what plan I'm on, what data center I'm in. Uh, of course, we do our, our exhaustive inventory uh, as part of our normal discovery process. And um, so that, that whole system is here. Uh, and you'll notice with the driver in, I now actually have out-of-band management control. So it uses the my account key and the UID to give me power controls uh, for packet machines, just as if they were IPMI management. So you can test packet. Um, and then I can do fun things. Uh, one of the new features in 1.6, or uh, sorry, 3.7, 3 is that I can change server, I can change my, um, I, my, icons and things like that. That's a fun, I, I like to be able to do things like that. Um, and so you could actually drive this in an automated way too and create custom icons for, for servers, things like that. Um, so that's looking pretty good. Uh, this machine is up. Let's check in with where we are on status. So at this point, we have completed all of the items for the wizard. I can mark it complete. And, it'll, and uh, wow, I am done. I got the systems up and running. Uh, something to show you that's, that might be interesting. I can look at my jobs log to see uh, activity. So these are my discovery runs. Uh, I can actually jump into one and see the log of what was done in each action and move backwards um, and what's going on. One of the new features, if you haven't seen things in a while, is that uh, we also have uh, a logs API. And so you'll see um, all of the, we actually pull back the logs into the UX so you can see exactly what's going on on the system. There's a, some amazing capabilities about uh, dynamic log levels and, and things like that that are um, pretty powerful in their own right. Um, and then another thing that's, that I, I find super fun is being able to go in and I can pick a machine and then my resolution's a little bit funky. Uh, I can then go in and do bulk actions to reboot. In this case, uh, my plugin's not working uh, correctly. I probably put the key in wrong. And so it's telling me, hey, it didn't work. 
uh, if I wanted to send this thing back to a discovery stage and re rerun some processes, I could do that, and that'll be happier. So it'll actually show me uh, that it completed that action. And then the other thing to note here is that these are giving me live updates. So as changes go in with this process, boy, it's super fast. Uh, I'm going to do this again so you can watch it change. It actually gets live updates in the UX. Uh, see as packet discover, and then as these events come in, we will get um, real live actions happening against the system, uh, and it'll update uh, all the screens uh, with live updates for the activity. Um, and so I'm not sure what's going on with these other servers. Let's look at the details and see. Maybe I, I fat fingered something in their configuration, or maybe I just need to reboot. So the iPixie script URL is correct. No, it's not. Uh, so here's my problem. So I did not include the iPixie statement in here, so those machines aren't going to show up. So I want to delete them. Uh, let's see. So we'll delete it. I don't think you can fix it. Let's double check this. I don't think you can edit the iPixie information for packet servers. Let's see, details and manage. Sometimes it's nice to, to hit issues like this because these are common things that you're going you're gonna to encounter as you go through this process of learning. I've already given you the whole tour. Um, so, you know, if you got it working, then, then go ahead. But I needed to include the default.ipixie into the system. And now Packet's not behaving. Uh, let's go back and just create a brand new server. Uh, server 5. zero. Uh, obviously you can use other sizes. And so in this case we're going to go back. Here's 155. 155. And here I'm going to have default iPixie. I'm going to test it, which I like to do. There you go. Tested it. I'm going to go in and tell it to persist that Pixie boot. Uh, I don't know. Oh. That's not right. Strange. All right, so now we're trying uh, that server. I'm going to go in while I wait for that to boot. Nope, it's not letting me manage it, so I'm just going to delete it. So server 5 in here. Uh, let's check our out-of-band info. Copy. Server 5, I'm going to copy that. Once again, we don't set, you can see it's already coming through the system. So we're getting a whole bunch of activity around jobs. Uh, this this, is, this machine means it's booting, so we've probably hit, we're not going to see any subnets. Um, but we definitely have a machine coming in. It hasn't finished discovery, so we're not going to see it. Um, from that that perspective yet. Uh, let's see. And right, by default, oh, there we go. So now we're actually watching it boot. It's one of my favorite things to do with these packet systems is watch them boot. And so uh, this boot process uh, you can, you can see it pick up Sledgehammer. Remember, it's the out-of-bound console hasn't been set yet, so it's going to take a second boot before you can watch it go through the complete process because the, um, the, ter the um, terminal settings aren't, aren't set correctly. And I'm just waiting now for it to, to start the Sledgehammer process. If you're curious about what your, where your API keys are, um, you should be able to find them under your profiles under API keys. Uh, I'm not going to click there because you don't need to see mine. Um, but plugins under this packet plugin, uh, you this is where you're going to want to see that. And we we respect password um, fields. It's part of the metadata for a parameter. So if I was to look in the parameters under packet API key, what you'd see is there, it's actually identified as a as a as a password field so that uh, 
it's not shown on the UX. It is stored in, in plain text internally in the in the system. Um, there is a roadmap item to encrypt parameters. That's a pretty sophisticated thing. Uh, so now you can see server five has come through the process. It's now available as a full-fledged machine. Um, and that's it. We now have our packet systems. Uh, thank you for spending some extra time in the video watching me troubleshoot what went wrong. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, jump into our community, right? Uh, you can come in on Slack and uh, request an account. We're very active. Uh, there's a lot of people in community who want to talk, um, chat, figure out how to make uh, operations better, and we hope you'll join us. Thanks.